born in a small town. Town might be a little generous, actually. Not more than a dozen families. I mean, maybe 100, 150 people. But we never bothered to count people. It didn't matter. You knew when somebody was missing. You knew where they were. You knew what they were doing. You knew what they had for breakfast. You knew when they went to the bathroom. It was a small town and there was not a lot of privacy. We were on the back side of this hill. On the other side of this hill, to us it was a mountain. On the other side was a valley so rich and so green. It's amazing. But that's not where I lived. I lived in a small town on the other side of the mountain where everywhere you looked was rock. Our houses were caved, were really more like caves. They were cut into the side of the rock. My bed was rock. My, my whole life was rock. And just think how it would echo. All that rock. Stone as far as the eye could see. Stone was what we knew. My fiance, that's your word, not ours. My fiance was a stone cutter. You've called him a carpenter, but you really underestimate the amount of trees that we had available to us. <laughs> what we had was rock. And so Joseph would go and walk about an hour's walk every day, and that's where he would cut stone, and that's where he would craft things, and he's pretty good, I'm told. We've been engaged to be married. Betrothed is really a more appropriate term for a while now. In a town like this, there's not a lot of options. And so he's older than me, but I wasn't going to marry my cousin. And so it is what it is. In a town like this, you're always looking out for each other and what's best for the community. It's the only way that a group of 150 can survive, surrounded by rock. My parents say he comes from a good family, and we certainly know everything about his family. And they think that he's going to be a good husband and a good father. And he's done all right by me so far. His father brought gifts to my father. My father, in return, will soon send me to go live with him. But for now, I'm still in Dad's house. And what a surprising time this has been. I didn't think I'd ever get to leave this town of rock and stone. But well, when things started to show, I got to go visit my cousin. And she's pregnant too. None of this really makes any sense. But I got to leave home. I've been hanging out there for a little while. And I just came back to find out that there's another trip I had to take. This time, I'm going to get to see the whole countryside. Because Emperor Augustus has decided he wants to make sure he's getting every penny he's due. And so we had to pack up our things. I mean, we don't really know how long this whole business is going to take place. So we had to pack up what little we have and go all the way from our rock town in Nazareth through my beautiful fertile valley, past Jerusalem and the temple where it stands on that big rock, and go another 10 kilometers to where his family is from. See, Joseph is from the family of David. And you've probably heard of Jerusalem as David's city, because why would you not? I mean, that's the place where everything happens in our land. That's where you go when you want to offer a sacrifice, when you need to offer sacrifice, when you want to offer thanks and praise. That's really the center of our whole world. And we call that David's city because obviously he was the one who decided to establish the temple there, built by his son Solomon. But no... That's not where I get to go. 
We've got to go to Bethlehem, which is about as big and exciting as my hometown. Also, you know what they have in Bethlehem? More rocks. <laughs> but before you get there, there's this beautiful green area. And that's where they keep the sheep. I mean, thank goodness it's not raining anymore. At least the emperor has that going for him. There's another thing about this journey where I want to set you straight. I've seen your pictures of me riding on a donkey all the 80 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. I need you to understand something about my culture, and I need you to understand my culture without judging us with your... 21st century eyes and worldview. In my culture, I would not be the one riding on the donkey. The man controlled the animal. I mean, who knows what could happen if I was riding on that thing? No, thank you. I took the safe route, walking alongside as Joseph commanded the donkey all those 80 miles. Thank you very much. I was much safer. And so, we left our valley, we left our, our hill, and we started to make our way first to Jerusalem. Oh. <coughs> she was just as beautiful as I'd imagined. You know, as a young woman, I don't get to always make all those Passover pilgrimages. That's not guaranteed for me, but I got to see her that day. Oh, it aches just thinking about the journey, though. Up and down those mountains. Lots of dirt. Lots of stone. We made our way past those green, lush fields. Sheep everywhere. We made it all the way to that godforsaken city. City. City of David. Bethlehem. You have to know, our houses are not mansions. And there were a lot of people that were uprooted by this emperor having to go register. And, and so there were lots of folks back in Bethlehem. We didn't have hotels like you folks have today, or motels. And inn is really not a good translation. Our houses were one room. And guess what they were made out of? So you're catching on. <laughs> Cut into the sides of caves, there's not a lot of room to expand or pop up a little tent or a little lean-to on the outside. So when there was no room in the inn, I mean, what are you going to do? There's no room. We found a place. We found this lovely cave. It had everything you could ever need, I mean, if you were a shepherd. We were able to stay. We were out of the heat of the sun. Joseph went about his business taking care of this nonsense sense of stuff. We were there a while. I know you think it happened like that. We were there a while. And it came, and it happened. I was all alone. My mother wasn't there. My father wasn't there. I didn't really know anybody. But it happened. And I took that precious baby boy, gift from God. We named him Jesus. It's just this idea. I wrapped him really tight in these swaddling clothes. You newcomers let your kids be all willy-nilly and the legs all akimbo, but that's not how we do it in my culture. We wrap them tight when they're still fresh and moldable so that they can be strong. Everything I had, I wrapped them up. I looked around and what did I see? Rocks. <laughs> I placed him there in the manger. Now, I don't know why you guys make these things out of wood. 
I've already told you we didn't have any of that. <laughs> and it's falling apart. Why would you make anything out of wood? It looked a lot more like this. That's a manger, folks. This is what our feed troughs were made from. They were cut from stone the way a manger should be. Now, they're not real portable, but that's okay, because, you know, the barn's not that big. I can hear them with the echo from the stone. Don't worry. It's not that big. It's just right for my precious baby boy. I placed him in that manger carved of stone, and he took a place in my heart, probably in yours, for all eternity. Thanks be to God and amen. My friends, I was struck on this trip to the Holy Land to see a manger carved in stone. It completely changed my perception of what it would have been like to place your baby in that. And I couldn't help but think of the way that that manger had been prepared and carved in stone and chiseled away, not by Mary and not by Joseph, but by someone who'd come who knows how long before. And who knows how long that manger would last. I don't know the dates on these mangers, but they weren't made yesterday. And I was convicted in thinking, how do I need to be carved? What needs to be chiseled away to receive the Christ child in me? And then I realized it doesn't matter. Oh, there's stuff that needs to be chiseled away every day, most moments of every day. I have things that need to be chiseled away, but that does not stop Jesus Christ from living and working and moving through me, my friends. And that does not stop Jesus Christ from dwelling in you as well. When our worship started tonight, Kaveki sang, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And that is exactly what Christmas is about. The one who came to dwell and to be with us, to dwell in and through us, and it doesn't matter what needs to be chiseled away. That can't stop him. It didn't stop Mary. It didn't stop Joseph. God is not stopped by our human flaws. In fact, through the waters of baptism, they pour over us, and it is proclaimed that we are children of God. And Martin Luther said, every day when you wash your face, be reminded of your baptism that you live forgiven as a child of God. Let this water come over you and chisel away the sin of the day so that we may be ready to shine the light of Christ with the world. Thanks be to God and amen. amen. amen.